So welcome back, everyone. Uh, thanks for being here for the afternoon session. Uh, so we will have three presentations from CA experts this afternoon, followed by a panel session, which will be in the form of, of a question and answer sessions. And uh, it, the panel session will be animated by Eric Mercier later on. So, uh, for this afternoon, Antonio Clemente will present later results on transmit array antenna technology and will in particular present uh, some results obtained for SATCOM uh, application in KA bond. And last but not least, Benoit Miscopin will address waveform uh, and system level challenge for 5G non-terrestrial networks communication. So let's move to Antonio Clemente presentation. Antonio Clemente started his research activity in Italy, where he received the MS degrees in telecommunication engineering and remote sensing. He then moved to France and received his PhD degree in signal processing and telecommunication from Rennes 1 University. And since uh, 2013, he has been a research engineer at CLAT wireless technology department. His current research interest includes fixed beam and electronically reconfigurable, reconfigurable transmitter antenna, RIS millimeter wave, and subterrace antenna. He has authored and co authored more than 100 uh, papers in international journals and conferences, received 15 patents, and has won several awards for conference presentations. So the floor is yours. So thank you very much, Stephanie for your presentation. Uh, good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. So in this presentation, I will, uh, I will talk about uh, our vision on how electronic stable transmitter antenna can be used to, to implement uh, future SATCOM antenna for a key band. I will try to do some comparison even with the, with the state of the art. Uh, I will explain you our vision also. <clears throat> so uh, today we know that uh, the, what we can call Internet of Space so is the, the future Internet of uh, Things, uh, where uh, we can connect everything in the world everywhere. Uh, how we know from the previous presentation in the morning, there are more than 90% of the, of the Earth that is not connected. So uh, there is also a recent report from uh, Rural America and Technology uh, Association that uh, show that 31% of the uh, USA uh, people are not connected with a broadband solution. So, so for this reason, the, inter the Internet of Space uh, dream for the moment uh, uh, is not yet a reality. Uh, so the key band, that is the band, the frequency band spanning from uh, 70.7 to 21.2 gigahertz, so in reality this is the, the key band um, uh, that is used for the, for the downlink. Uh, and uh, the, the, the other band from 27.5 at 31 giga uh, can be uh, the band that can be used uh, to to, 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 to have um, the Internet of Space, the, this revolution uh, reality, uh, because in this by using this frequency band we can uh, achieve a very big bandwidth uh, and we can, uh, we can achieve maybe some services uh, such as 5G connection or 6G connection. Uh, so in order to do this, one, uh, one key element uh, to do the connectivity between the hertz, so from the mobile, Maybe a mobile terminal, such as here, you have an airplane. Uh, so to do, to do the connection between this, this airplane to the satellite, uh, one key element is the development of very efficient uh, antennas. Uh, we need to have a, a, a small surface in order to, to be compliant with the integration constraint. Uh, we need to reduce the profile of the antenna, so the total thickness of the antenna. Uh, and even in the case of, uh, so we need to follow the satellite, so we need to develop some kind of beamforming techniques. In order to do this, uh, we will see after we have different possibilities, we can achieve mechanical beamforming uh, or electronic steerable antennas in order to follow the satellite. Uh, in order to do this, we need to have a very low power consumption. So there are several points that we need to discuss and we need to uh, to demonstrate before then 
uh, we can realize a very efficient antenna for this kind of application. So, we can so in general, uh, if, we, if we look on the aircraft terminal antenna, uh, or for the key band antenna terminal, uh, we need two different antenna in order to have a, a uplink in, uh, in receiver and the downlink uh, in the in the it depends where you where you where you are seeing. For the terminal po point of view, the receiver antenna so is the downlink from the satellite uh, is in this frequency band, uh, and uh, the the higher frequency band is used for the for the for the uplink. Uh, you have a um, uh, other specifications that are important is the bandwidth, the instantaneous bandwidth that is between 250 megahertz up to 500 megahertz. Uh, you need to develop uh, switchable circular polarization. So uh, sometimes uh, you will have, you will transmit or receive in uh, uh, left circularization, uh, circular polarization. In, the, in other case, you need to have right-handed circular polarization. Uh, the antenna gain should be higher than 30 dBi. Uh, for both receiver and transmitter antenna. Uh, other important specification from the point of view of the receiver antenna, you need to have a G sur T uh, higher than 12 dB Kelvin uh, and the ERP of the antenna should be higher than 66 uh, dBm. So with a scanning coverage that is very wide, uh, actual ratio specification also are very, very hard uh, and sometimes you need to have two different beams in order to, to do the handover with the satellite. So how we can do this? So for example, there are several companies now that are developing this kind of antenna. So you have the FinCom antenna that today is used of a very big number of aircraft. Uh, so this is an antenna that uses mechanical uh, beam scanning. So uh, you can see here we have two different antenna. So the first one, the bigger one is used for the downlink in the lower frequency, and the small one used for the uplink in the higher frequency. So you have motors uh, inside this antenna in order to, 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 to move the panel uh, and generate the beam forming in 2D. So other possibility is the electronic steerable antenna that basically can be achieved by using phased array. So you have a demonstration here that uh, has been developed from the, from the group of uh, Professor Rebates. Uh, and uh, in San Diego, that has, uh, yeah, you can see here some partners of this project. Uh, even in this case, we have two different, uh, two different antenna. The first one uh, is for the, for, the, for the downlink, and the second one for the, for the uplink. So the important key specification that you can see here is the power consumption. Here you have uh, uh, modules, so you have chip that are connected on each element of the antenna in order to generate different function. So if you are in the, uh, in the receiver band, you have all the receiver, you have the LNA, uh, after, you have, uh, after the LNA you have the phase shifter and the amplitude control. And in the other side you have the power amplifier, phase shifting and amplitude control. So uh, what you can see here that in order, for example, if you are in the, in the key band, in the Eiger band, uh, the power consumption can be between several hundred watt even bigger than this. So this is a very important key, uh, a very important point uh, for developing this kind of antenna. So another possibility is to do, uh, we can do some hybrid structure. We can combine both mechanical steerable antenna and electronic steerable antenna in order to develop one, uh, for example, the scanning in azimuth by mechanical steering and the scanning in, in elevation by considering electronic beam scanning. So there are different possibilities to generate this kind of antenna. So basically the classical uh, architecture is the one based on, uh, on phased array. But you can also use some kind of metasurface, for example. There, are a, there is a company in USA that uh, develop uh, a kind of metasurface antenna based on, on liquid crystal. The name is SkyMeta. Uh, you can do also reflect array uh, that are uh, electromagnetic surface that works such as a flat uh, reflector where you can control the, the phase uh, on each element or you can do what we call transmit array. So in this presentation we present you the transmit array antenna because uh, for us is one of the, the, the best possibilities in order to achieve this kind of antenna with some limitation. So I will explain you all of this. 
So what we propose uh, at CA is to develop this kind of antenna. So a transmitter antenna basically is a flat panel antenna like this uh, that is illuminated spatially uh, by a feed. In this case, I, uh, I presented here a classical horn antenna. So in order to reduce the power division loss from the feed point to the antenna elements, so here you have several hundred or several thousand of antenna elements, that we need to control in amplitude and phase. So in order to reduce the loss in the power division network, uh, we can do what we call a spatial illumination. You know, so we have a spatial feed. Uh, this kind of, uh, of feeding network, feeding architecture, is very uh, efficient where we go up in frequency. So it can be used up to 300 giga, even more than 300 giga. So what we propose is to have two different panels, one for the TX for the moment. We have two different panels, but we are looking also how we can do shared aperture in order that you have only one single panel. So you have two different panels, one for the TX antenna, so is the uplink, one for the RX antenna, that is the downlink. Uh, on both panels, we can generate both commutable circular polarization. So you can have left handed or uh, right handed. Uh, and in order to do this, uh, what we use to control the phase on each element in order to do electronic beam scanning, uh, we use some commutators, some uh, RF switch. So, uh, basically, our structure, our antenna that you can see here, so you have this demonstrator uh, in the stand, on, in the late part of the demonstrator. So this is a one-bit uh, transmitter antenna, electronic steerable. So one bit because for each element, we can generate zero or 180 degrees of phase shifting. And we will demonstrate that even with, with this kind of antenna, we can generate beam forming electronically, even if there are some losses uh, in, the, in, in the beam forming of the antenna. But you can do a very efficient uh, beam steering function. So what is the, the, the positive point of this kind of antenna is that we have no phase shifter, we have no power amplifier on each element. So basically, you have a big power amplifier or several uh, power amplifier on the bottom, or on, the, on, the, on the antenna that is used to illuminate this kind of antenna. Sometimes can be a, a very good point, this, and sometimes can be maybe a limitation. So, but there are several points that we can discuss on this. Uh, the other positive point of the transmitter antenna is that you have no losses on because you have no, no parasitic radiation of the feed network. Uh, at, if, consider to, if we consider uh, the reflector ray antenna, uh, a transmitter ray can be, uh, have, a, have also another advantage that uh, you are working as a, a lens. So basically we can perform near field illumination in order to reduce the, the thickness of this kind of antenna. So this is another positive point. Uh, you can uh, easily achieve the phase control by considering uh, varactor, pin diodes, MEMS, uh, phase change material for the future also, why not, or other kind of structure. Uh, you don't need calibration and equalization for a phased array in order to generate for each uh, patch antenna, for each element of the, of the antenna, the same phase shifting uh, or, or the, the relative phase shifting. You need to do a, a calibration that can be very hard, sp uh, especially when you have uh, several thousand of elements. So uh, you need to, to have this calibration for uh, each level of temperature, for each condition, so it can be a very big, uh, uh, a big step in the design. You need equalization between the different channels, even uh, in the case of, uh, of the phased array, and you don't need this for a transmitter array. And another positive point of the transmitter array is this, uh, this kind of solution can be easily scal uh, can be scalable in different frequency band. So for a phased array, you need to develop a specific phase shifter, a specific, uh, a specific MMIC for each frequency band. Though. So the cost can be very high, even in the design. So what about transmitter array antenna technology? how we can generate the phase shift control on a transmitter array. So you have here the first unit cell that we develop uh, as CAA. So it's a binary unit cell. Uh, so basically you have four different metal layers. The first layer is here after you have a ground plane. So this is the first antenna that receives the power from the focal source. After this, you have a ground plane in order to isolate the first antenna from the second one. You have here the bias line of two pin diodes that are integrated. So in this case are two pin diodes, but can be RF switch, other RF, uh, RF switches. So you have two pin diodes here that are connected to the first antenna. So why we select pin diodes? 
So we done some tests uh, by considering MEMS, uh, radio frequency MEMS. Uh, the, the positive point of the MEMS is that we have extremely low power consumption. So basically you have no current uh, on the MEMS. Uh, at, the, at the difference of a, of a pin diode where you have a, a current between 1 mA or 20 mA for each element. Uh, but the, the negative point of the MEMS uh, is, is the, real, the, real, the reliability of the MEMS. And the pin, pin diodes is a very mature technology that you can buy easily. So the, the negative point of the pin diodes are maybe the power consumption, but for the future we can work on this. So uh, the first, the second unit cell that we develop at CA is the one based on four different phase states. So basically you have a phase shifting, a relative phase shift between each unit cell of 90 degrees. So uh, when we use this kind of unit cell, uh, we can improve uh, the, the phase shifting resolution on the antenna array, and we can also improve the, the quality of the radiation pattern that we can generate of this kind of, by considering this kind of antenna. So at the cost of additional power consumption, because we had two different pin diodes, uh, and, and an additional complexity in the design and optimization of, of this structure, and even in the cost of this structure, because the, the PCB that we need to realize is a little bit more complex. So how it works, uh, this structure? So if we consider the binary unit cell that you have here, so basically you have a U slot on the first antenna, and you have a no slot on the other antenna with two different pin diodes. By controlling the bias current, that you have, uh, that, that, that is, uh, is given by this line here, we can control the polarization of the antenna. So basically, we can control the, the for this reason, we call this kind of antenna holographic beamforming, because we can control the, f the, the current distribution on the radiation element, on the radiating element electronically, and by switching, by controlling the current, positive or negative, we can change the distribution of the, of the current on the array, and we can generate a zero on 180 degrees, oh, sorry, 180 degrees of phase shift. So if we add, uh, as in the case of the unit cell, ah, there is a problem, sorry. If we add uh, an additional phase shift layer, as in this case, uh, we, can, we can have uh, an additional two bi uh, one bits uh, of phase resolution because here we have a, a, a line that can generate a 90 degrees of phase shifting. And by controlling the two pin diodes that are on the bottom of the unit cell, we can control, we can add, add four different, we can have four different phase shifter. So here you can see the design where, that we developed for the SATCOM antenna solution. So here you have the frequency response in phase of the four different, of the four different phase state of the unit cell. Uh, so basically you have four different level of phase. Uh, this is for the downlink band, and this is for the uplink band. So basically you have a 90 degree of phase shifting from each phase state with an error maximum that is around 50 degrees. So now, how we can perform by considering this kind of unit cells, only, only one element is this, how we can perform what we would like to do. So that is basically this kind of antenna. So we design both unit cells in both frequency. And after, uh, if you remember, there are different specifications that we need to have. Uh, if you look at the design that we develop here, this is a linear polarized uh, antenna. How we can perform with this kind of unit cell the circular polarization and the commutation of the circular polarization. So basically, what we can implement uh, is a, a, a distribution, a sequential distribution of unit cell, VAH polarized. So basically, you have a, a, a patch antenna that is vertical, another one that is horizontal. And by controlling the phase between the different elements, we can generate the circular polarization. So we know from the, from the antenna theory uh, that when we have uh, classical uh, distribution, so se sequential rotation with a very, uh, with a, a schematic distribution that is fixed, uh, we can generate grating lobes in some direction. So in order to reduce uh, 
uh, these grating lobes in the radiation pattern, what we can do is to have a random distribution uh, on the antenna of this VH unit cell. So in order to do this, we can optimize this, this kind of structure in order to improve the gain and have a reduced uh, uh, the actual ratio. So uh, it was this that we done in this kind of antenna. So what you can see here is that when we, we have this kind of random uh, distribution, we can generate even in a, in a 45, so this is the phase distribution that we impose on the antenna, uh, that basically is a four different state phase distribution. And here you can see the radiation pattern uh, of the antenna. So this is the main beam, the main beam when we would like to, to steer the beam in the cut plane 45 degrees uh, and 45 degrees uh, in elevation. So this is the, the principal, uh, the fundamental uh, component, so the copolar component, and this is the cross-polar component. So basically you have no grating loops. Uh, when you have a fixed, uh, schema, uh, a fix, a fixed scheme uh, here uh, of sequential rotation, so basically you will have a, a grating lobe that will appear here. So the, the combination, the random, the random combination will reduce this, will mitigate the, the presence of, of this grating lobe. So after that, if you look here, the blue one uh, is the left circular polarization, the red one is the right circular polarization. So by controlling electronically, electronically this, sorry, by controlling electronically this phase distribution, we can even change the polarization. Okay, here you have the red, now is the copolar, that is the right-handed circular polarization, and the, the blue one, that is the left-handed circular polarization, now is the cross-polar component. So by controlling so the phase distribution, we can generate the beam forming, and we can also change the, 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 the circular polarization distribution. So here you can see uh, the frequency response in terms of gain for the two different antennas. So in the first case, you have an antenna composed by uh, 38 by 38 element. In the second case, you have an antenna composed of 50 by 50 elements. So it's a quite big panel uh, of antenna. Uh, so you can see here the peak gain that is achieved as a function of the frequency in the case of the beam that is uh, uh, perpendicular to the, so is the broad side. Uh, and after you can see the loss in gain when we start to, st to steer the beam for both downlink and uplink frequency band. So what is important to, 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 to highlight here that in, the, in, uh, in our structure we lose 3dB because we have a combination on VAH uh, unit cell in order to generate the, the circular polarization, or uh, the circular polarization uh, uh, switching. So this is a point that we are working on. I will show you some, uh, some results after. So what about the radiation pattern? So here I, I, we plotted the three different combination of radiation pattern as a function of the frequency. Uh, and uh, by considering also the one of the possibility radiation mask that we, we need to, to respect in, in the SATCOM. So what we can see here is that there are some point of our radiation pattern that are out of the mask. But this is a typical problem even for the phase, for the phase array because this, uh, this radiation mask has been defined uh, for, a, for a mechanical scanning antenna. So there are several possibilities to mitigate this problem, this phenomena. Basically we can, uh, we can apply a synthesis procedure on the antenna in order to mitigate this kind of, uh, but for the moment is not yet the case in order to mitigate this kind of, ant of problems. So the peak gain that we realize, uh, we can realize in, uh, in, the, in the downlink band uh, is around 28.7 dBi with this kind of, uh, of surface. So we can increase this, this gain by considering uh, different possibility because uh, as I said before, here we lose 3 dB in order to generate the, the, the commutation of the circular polarization. So here you can see also the radiation pattern for the uplink antenna. Uh, in this case, we have a, an antenna of 50 by 50 element. Uh, we can achieve a peak gain around 31.8 dBi. And even in this case, you can see that there are some problems, some parts of the, ratio, of the radiation pattern that are out of the mask. But even in this case, we can, in this case, we can apply some kind of a synthesis procedure in order to mitigate this phenomenon. And even in this case, 
uh, we can also gain 3 dB more uh, if we can uh, achieve the, 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 the switching of the polarization by considering alternative methodology. So, in order to demonstrate this antenna, we developed a quarter uh, of the panel only for the uplink antenna. So, we develop an antenna that is composed of 24 by 24 elements. You can see here the, the antenna. So, this is the board that we use to control the, the pin diodes, to bias the pin diodes and control electronically the, the antenna and the beam. So you have 2,304 uh, pin diodes integrated on the surface. We, we have two bit phase resolution. Uh, we can do electronic B scanning up to 60 degrees on, two, on, on, the, on the full space. Uh, we can also achieve a switchable circular polarization. Uh, and the power consumption only of the panel by considering the antenna and uh, the steering logic and, um, uh, and the microcontroller that is used to calculate the phase shifting uh, is, around, is lower than 50 watt. So to this power consumption we need to add the power amplifier. So here you can see uh, an example of measurement of the radiation pattern so that we demonstrate, we, we measure in, like a, in an acute chamber. The peak gain of this antenna is around 24 dBi, is only a quarter of the panel that we demonstrated, we, uh, I presented before. And uh, with an actual ratio for both polarization that is lower than 1 dB, this is the broadside one. Uh, it's the broadside, uh, uh, so it's for this beam. Uh, the actual ratio is lower than 1 dB on the full bandwidth. And the scan loss uh, is lower than, so basically the loss between this and this point is lower than 4.5 dB. That is typical, typical in the phase array also. So now, uh, if we would like to estimate the power consumption uh, on this panel, so this is only the TX panel. So is the, the power consumption for the, for the full panel then can achieve, for example, a near P, uh, as the specification ask of 66 dBm. So basically we have 62.5 watt that uh, we need to use to control the beam forming, so, so to feed the, 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 the antenna in terms uh, of pin diodes. I consider to this calculation that each pin diode uh, is fitted by considering 5 mA, uh, by considering that our boards are fitted by considering 2.5 volts, so this is the power consumption and we need to add, in order to have this ERP, a power amplifier uh, that, can achieve, that can have a consumption around 100 watt. So the biggest part of the consumption is due to the power amplifier. How we can mitigate a little bit this? By considering, uh, for example, if we feed, the, if we bias the pin diodes with 1 mA, we can reduce of an important factor the power consumption uh, bigger than uh, a, a, a third of the power consumption. And the other possibility to do this uh, is to develop specific components, such as uh, MEMS, for example, that has uh, no power consumption. Almost. So what next? How we can mitigate the, the 3B loss that we have on the antenna in order to generate the the, the switching of, polari of polarization, we can use a polarizer. So we can use an additional lever, level of pin diodes uh, here. So maybe it's better if we can see. So the, the previous unit cell is this one. So you have four pin diodes that are used in order to control the phase. And we add two additional pin diodes and an additional layer in order to control the, the polarization. So this is a, pro a prototype that we, demo, we developed, that, but uh, we have not yet measurement of this. So here we have two different transmit array, one for the phase control and one for the polarization control. So basically, this is the, the maximum gain that we can achieve with this surface, 24 by 24 element, if we consider linear polarization. This is the loss, this is the gain that we achieve when we have the random sequential rotation. And this is the gain that we achieve when we add the additional polarizer. So basically we can gain around 2 dB in the, in the gain. 
So I hope that we'll, we will demonstrate this experim experimentally in the future. So the, the other point uh, in our research roadmap, the first one is how we can demonstrate a shared aperture transmitter array. So now we have two different apertures. In the future, we would like to do only one aperture. So basically here you have two different feeds that works in two different frequency band. And here you have only one aperture. For the moment, we have only a passive prototype that we dem for demonstrate this. I will show you only one example. And the other point, the other important point is how we can reduce the, the thickness of this antenna. So the, the answer is that we need to develop a specific focal uh, array uh, in order to make near field illumination. So even in this case, we have a demonstrator uh, in, uh, in, our, in our booths. So here you have the example of the, of the dual band antenna that we developed in, in, uh, in both frequency band. And you have a single panel. Uh, for the moment, it's a fixed beam. So we generate only one beam. And we can move the feed. We can, have, we can have mechanical beam scanning for this kind of antenna. But for the moment, it's not electronically. So the message uh, of, this, of this presentation is that for the future generation of smart antenna, uh, for uh, SATCOM on the move terminal, uh, we need to, to develop uh, low power consumption, we need to have ultra low profile antenna in order to be compatible with the integration specification, and we need also to, to reduce the aperture size. So thank you very much for your attention. Uh, here you can see several, uh, the several partners that work with, uh, with us uh, to support uh, this project, uh, and all the people that uh, works uh, in this uh, in, in this activity so thank you very much thank you antonio for this rich presentation for sharing your roadmaps which is full of items in, uh, regarding the transmit array technology if you have some questions we have a couple of minutes hi thanks a lot for Okay. Thanks a lot for this very interesting presentation. Do you have some um, information on the mechanical characteristics as uh, weight, for example, size, and uh, what are your expectations in terms of uh, well, so target and roadmap? So basically, uh, yeah, I, I put some, uh, some typical uh, specifications. So uh, a typical antenna for the SATCOM uh, communication uh, has this kind of surface. Uh, 300 millimeter uh, times 600 millimeter. So this is our specification in order to achieve the, the gain that we need to have, uh, bigger than 35 dBi. Uh, the problem for the moment, the, bigger, the biggest problem that we have is the thickness. For the moment, in our solution, we estimate that for this kind of aperture, we need a, a 10 centimeter uh, of thickness. But as I presented here, by considering a specific uh, focal source uh, distribution. So here we can generate a near field illumination by considering this kind of cavity. So we have four different, in order to simplify, because we can, we can also use other kind of, uh, of possibility. So in the literature, you have folded transmit array. You have an example in our boots where you can reduce the, the focal distance of a factor three. The problem of the folding is that uh, at same time you will reduce the bandwidth. Okay, maybe for this kind of application is not the best uh, the best solution. Uh, another possibility is to use some kind of meta surface to illuminate the antenna and optimize this meta surface in near field. So this is one of the possibility. But even in this case, for the meta surface, you need to control exactly the lo the loss. And for a meta surface, sometimes the bandwidth will be small. So for this reason, what we propose is to to have this kind of cavity that can be seen as a shape, different uh, shape at uh, With Here we have four different feed points. We optimize the cavity, and we optimize also the, the interception uh, of the different cavities in order to control the side lobe level. And we generate a specific uh, taper on our transmit array aperture in order to generate our uh, mask so for the moment, we know that we, by considering this kind of structure, we can reduce of a factor two up to four 
the focal, the, the, the focal distance. So basically, we have some, uh, some results now that uh, are ongoing where we demonstrate the same antenna that you have here. So, but this is only a quarter of the panel for the moment. We have 24 elements by 24 elements. But in order to achieve the gain that we need, you have 50 by 50. So the typical focal distance here is around 7 cm. With the new structure, we can have 25 mm, so 2.5 cm. I don't, it's the pen because uh, uh, I, I, I don't remember what is the, the weight. But it's, it's not very big because for the moment it's not an industrial prototy prototype. So we have uh, a lot of metal. Uh, so uh, we need to see. Thanks. Thanks, Antonio, for the nice presentation. So I, I guess the specification there for Leo, and yeah. uh, generally you were comparing with Fincom. Fincom also has the possibility to switch between constellations. Yeah, yeah. So what will be the impact, especially for low horizon, you know, uh, uh, elevation? So this will be the first questions, and the second will be about the G over T that you expect, because especially when you go in reception, this is the main parameter you want to have a look at. Yeah. So, uh, about the first question, uh, even for the phased array, yeah, you can see that you can do the, 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 li the link budget, but also the, the power consumption budget uh, as a function of the, of the ERP that you need to generate. So, a typical specification for the LEO satellite is around uh, six, uh, 60, uh, 76 dBm. In order to do the geo satellite specification, is higher than this one. is around 80, 82. It depends from the which kind of satellite. So basically, the major impact will be on the power consumption. For this season, what will be will be increased, as in this case. So for this season, for me, one of the there are several research points that we need to that are common with the different technology. Even for the mechanical point of view, when you have a mechanical beam steering. You need to have a power amplifier, only one power amplifier, or an ad additional power amplifier to generate this, uh, this ERP. So basically, we need to work on the efficiency of the power amplifier in order to, to reduce the power consumption, for me, in the roadmap. This is one point. The second question is about the G over T. For the moment, with pin diodes, we have not yet done this kind of measurement, uh, but I hope that we'll be, we, we will do this in the future. So we have not yet the number. But I think that uh, the pin diodes has not a very strong impact on the... We will see. Thanks for the question. OK, thank you, Antonio. Thank you. Oops. So now, um, Benoit Miscopin will, will join me for the latest presentation of uh, this workshop. So Benoit obtained his uh, master's degree in 1998 from the Institut National Polytechnique de Grenoble and his PhD degree from Insalion in 2010. After uh, 15 years in Orange, he joined CLAT in 2015 as a research engineer and project manager on high-speed communication solution where he developed uh, MAC protocols for 5G applications uh, in the frame of different UE-funded uh, and national projects. And currently, he heads the wireless broadband system uh, lab. So, Benoit, the floor is yours. Thank you, Stephanie. Hi, everyone. So, uh, my name is Benoit. As um, Stephanie said, uh, I'm heading a, a, a lab uh, in Leti, dedicated to the design and implementation of uh, wireless systems. So, uh, in general, we, uh, in this kind of uh, situation, we talk about the, the system that we design, the custom system that we design. But this talk will be about uh, the evaluation of uh, 5G waveforms 
for non-terrestrial networks, meaning that we will focus uh, this talk about um, standardized uh, technologies and the evaluation of those technologies. So quickly on the introduction, so I, I, I won't spend so, spend so much time on the introduction because uh, we have uh, so many interesting uh, presentations this morning that sketches the let's say, uh, technological uh, landscape, uh, future uh, opportunities and so on and so forth. So, but, well, we, we are, uh, let's say, um, targeting the, the, the 5G and so the cellular network more in general. So here this slide reminds how important, how big, how, how capital became those networks in our daily life, in our uh, uh, industrial business and, and so on. So, um, but again, as said this morning, so many parts of the earth is not covered yet. So, and so so many parts of the business also require uh, a global coverage for ubiquitous access, for service continuity, for service release, resilience, and uh, this kind of. Uh, major concerns that terrestrial network cannot offer, of course. And the object of this talk is then trying to give an answer to this simple question of whether standardized waveforms, waveform standardized by 3GPP, can actually be translated into satellite context, whereas they have been designed and deployed for a strictly terrestrial context first. Okay, so um, for, for this presentation, I, I will give you two examples of recent collaborations that we had in, uh, in the lab, and which um, are based on the great knowledge that we have on, on waveform designs, waveform simulation, waveform implementation, and so on. So, the first one is in 20, sorry, 2018, so um, some years ago, but it was made uh, when 5G new radio has been uh, specified. And the, the question was about uh, how this 5G new radio can be used for downlink uh, geostationary uh, satellite communication. And the other one, which will be longer in the, in the talk today, is about how um, NB-IoT, Naroban IoT uh, technology can be used and usable, let's say, uh, for both GEO and LEO contexts. And it, this has been done uh, quite recently because as we speak now, this is currently uh, presented within a conference uh, by uh, a colleague of mine who ran this, uh, this study. Okay, so let's start first with uh, 5G new radio. So, quickly, um, a, a briefly sketch of, of, this, uh, of this new radio. So, what does that mean? New, new radio, uh, it's the first uh, 3GPP specification for 5G. So, it's the first specification of the air interface of 5G. And it has been... Um, uh, frozen in, in specification in 2018 in the uh, what we call the release 15. Okay, so now this morning uh, Mohammed uh, talked about the release 17, which is uh, just frozen. So uh, 5G has been, uh, 5G new radio has been introduced uh, four years ago now. And uh, it's based on uh, the very famous OFDM modulation, which is uh, uh, the one that is used for, for 4G. And compared to 4G, this 5GNR shows great uh, scalability and flexibility in the possibility of uh, finding parameters to tune the, the, the physical layer and adapt this physical layer to uh, different contexts and, uh, let's say, uh, service uh, requirements. Of course, since 2018, there have been some evolutions uh, that are now integrated uh, in the standard. Uh, to further uh, support uh, uh, enhanced um, service like uh, ultra low latency for support, 
um, uh, millimeter wave uh, communication, for in, to name a few. But the important fact is that it has been uh, defined first at that date, at the date of uh, this, uh, this study, it, uh, it was defined only for terrestrial context. Okay, so what does this scalability mean? So you have here um, a brief sketch of LTE in blue and the three other ones are LTE. This represents the uh, minimum allocable resource element for a, a user and it spans over a, a, a in, in 4G in 180 kilohertz and uh, uh, it, there is a, a duration of this, the, this symbol here which is shown which is one millisecond. One millisecond. And compared to uh, 4G, 5G provide the possibility of tuning one parameter which is actually govern what we call the numerology and this parameter allows to uh, make this uh, resource block uh, spanning over a, a wider um, bandwidth and takes uh, less time to be transmitted. And then it can be used, for instance, for addressing a low latency or for addressing wider uh, bandwidths like, uh, uh, like uh, millimeter wave communication. Okay, so th this numerology is typically what can be used to tune a physical layer and this is what we will play on uh, for the, the we have played on for this uh, for this study. So, what's what is the context of, of this study that was proposed by the partner we, we we worked with? So, this was as I said downlink communication using geo satellite and assuming uh, the use of the KA, KA band around uh, 20 gigahertz. So, we would like to see whether this release 15 was able to to be used using standard and non-standard numerologies, okay, assuming a bandwidth of 20 to 40 megahertz. So the goal was to, to see whether we, we can stretch, it, it is necessary to stretch or not the numerologies of, of 5G uh, to, to make different scenarios uh, achievable or not. So those scenarios are, are uh, depicted here. So we wanted to cover um, scenarios that span from a rural area, from suburban, let's say, uh, uh, near city or city center, uh, aircrafts with our aero uh, scenario, and also railway right with covering trains, like it has been uh, slightly uh, discussed this morning. Okay, so it covers. Uh, a different uh, level of uh, velocities and different also um, propagation environment that could be more or less uh, difficult uh, for an, a radio standpoint. So for instance here you have this radio channel for a uh, train. This is shown here because it's uh, not funny but uh, very illustrative. It represents the level of power received at, at the, at the, on, on the train by the, the, the satellite receiver. So it's basically constant, but sometimes uh, at regular spaces you have some drops of the, the received power and it corresponds to the moment where the, train, the, the, the receiver is exactly below a pole that cut the, 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 the signal, uh, the satellite signal. So we have to live the, with this kind of, uh, of environment when you are in a, in a train uh, context. Well, so this is the, the last slide before we, we, we switch to something else. Uh, what we, we actually did, um, in fact, th this study with this partner it was not only on, on this specific topic. There, there were other, uh, let's say, uh, work packages that uh, bring us uh, more, more uh, far away from, from, from this study. But anyway, uh, for, for this talk, let, let's focus on that. So what we did, uh, Remember, it's in 2018, so in 2018 we, we developed a, a full, fully compatible uh, um, physical layer uh, simulation environment of uh, 5GNR. So now it's a bit uh, out of date, but at that time it was a, a great ach achievement uh, anyway. And uh, on, on this uh, environment we implemented all what relates to the scenarios uh, that I, I just talked before. And also we implemented 
what make I, I think the, the, the most imp important part of this work um, models for the signal impairments that come from the implementation of the, of the modem on the payload. Meaning that, for instance, uh, assuming 20 gigahertz uh, frequency, you have a specific uh, uh, phase noise. We also implemented uh, the power amplifier non-linearities, the omics filter um, gabarit. And, and then all of these were imp uh, implemented on the simulation to make it more realistic. And anyway, so briefly, what, what could be said on, the, on this study, basically, uh, not very surprising, we can cover quite well the rural scenario because, okay, the medium velocity, the channel is good, so this is not a problem for, for 5G and all. Suburban is much more complicated because of the final, the, the fading channel that we have due to mobility, due to uh, buildings and so on, so um, we, we can't cover well this, this scenario. Railway, as we said, this can be covered, but the drop of uh, the, the, the signal level uh, prevent from using, uh, let's say, uh, highly efficient modulation schemes. Uh, so you have to, to take margin on, on the modulation scheme, and then it limits your, uh, your, your, uh, your throughput. And which is interesting is this IRO scenario with uh, this high velocity. This can be covered, actually, using extended numerologies. I mean, we, we, I, I showed you uh, before this mu equal one two. Uh, here we use uh, mu equal to four, but we have to tweak a bit the the five G N R specification because actually to restrict the bandwidth to ten to twenty uh, and forty megahertz, we had to let's say uh, modify a bit the, the rule of three G P P for allocating a resource for uh, for uh, signaling uh, channels. But anyway, uh, that, that, that was the, the, the first uh, experience that we have on, on uh, a standardized uh, system for a, a satellite context. And I propose to switch to uh, a more recent study about IoT. Um, so I, IoT, okay, uh, I think it's absolutely obvious that uh, the talk of uh, Astrocast this morning uh, showed this very well, that the, 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 let's say the, the global courage uh, for IoT is a great opportunity for service continuity. Because, okay, you have maritime communication, you have this uh, agricultural uh, stuff, you have uh, what they, they present also on the, uh, the oil and gas uh, exploitation. No doubt on that. Uh, what means IoT for 3GPP? It means narrowband IoT, which is the specification since release 13. Um, I don't know, it's uh, 2013 maybe, I'm not sure. Um, it, it's, the, it's the specification for um, low rate, long range and a massive number of IoT devices connectable, connectable to, the, to the, um, the infrastructure. So this specification is actually based on OFDM as well corresponds to a, a, a small bandwidth of 180 kilohertz for the downlink. And in order to gain uh, and to, to reach uh, higher uh, coverage uh, for uplink, because IoT is mainly about uplink, of course, um, not only, but uh, mainly, uh, in order to, 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 to gain uh, in the link budget for uplink, uh, there is a scalable uh, allocable bandwidth for uplink that should be much less than 180 kilohertz. I think the minimum is three something kilohertz. Um, and of course, as I said, and as it has been presented by Mohamed this morning from TAS, uh, there have been many add-ons to this specification of uh, release 13 on recent releases. All right. Um, so what th this is a collaboration we have we had with the National Center for Space Studies, the CNES in, in, in French. Uh, that it, it was after the uh, assessment of performance of the link and the performance of the full protocol of NBIoT in the context in the context of Leo NGO. Briefly, Leo means medium distance, high mobility, so high Doppler. 
uh, very short visibility of the, the satellite uh, when the device wakes up, synchronize, send the packet and release the bearer, you have max uh, between 40 seconds to uh, up to four minutes of time visibility of the, of the satellite. And in order to ensure a minimum uh, an acceptable latency, uh, the full coverage of Earth can be obtained with 60-ish satellites. And in comparison, GEO, no Doppler, but high propagation loss, very long uh, propagation delay, and only three uh, satellites to cover the, the, the full Earth because they are uh, far from, from, this, from, from Earth. Okay, so these are the, the reference, and uh, as I said, there is one which is currently presented uh, by um, my colleague Valerian, who uh, run these studies uh, here in CA. In CA. Okay, um, so the, the main main issue of Leo is, as it has been said this morning, is the Doppler. Here you have. For the uh, 58 spot of a Leo antenna, the distribution of the Doppler that you you you, you, you experience, so it's between minus 37 to plus 37 kilohertz compared to 180 kilohertz, so it's uh, 20 percent each, um, and we assume a, a L band. So this is a, a massive Doppler that needs to be addressed. So for that. Suitable strategies are required. Um, first, on the, on, the, on the EU side, you need to estimate, track, and compensate this Doppler. So it means that on the standard, you, you, you must have a reference signals uh, frequent enough to allow this estimation and tracking. But anyway, you, you can have, with the current uh, specification of the 3GPP, you, you can uh, achieve uh, this Doppler estimation and compensation. On the uplink side, it's a little bit different because, because you have uh, estimated on the downlink, you can tweak your uplink uh, frequency to make it uh, uh, to compensate the, the, the Doppler at the, the satellite receiver. And the problem is the uplink synchronization, which is uh, one of the main issues because of the long propagation delay and because also of the time distribution of the different, sat the, the different UEs that transmit over the satellite. So the satellite needs to search for the signal during a, a quite long uh, time window. So this requires specific reference signal to, to make it uh, realistic. And once you have your time synchronization, you can estimate your uh, frequency offset and then compensate it on the, uh, on the uplink. Well, the good news is that this is feasible, and once you have uh, uh, estimated and compensated this Doppler, then the rest of your receiver uh, remains unchanged compared to the terrestrial uh, model. So let's go to quickly uh, to uh, the, the performance uh, assessment. So first we start with physical layer, meaning that we assess the, the link performance, and then we will go to the system uh, performance, the capacity uh, assessment of the of, of uh, NBIoT. So briefly, first on the downlink, what should be said? Downlink uh, for a satellite is the, the let's say, the, 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 the strong link. Uplink is the weakest link. So here, basically, on, on the downlink, sorry, uh, what should be said on control channel? So it is broadcast channel and dedicated control channel. Basically, whether in Leo and Geo, there is no massive issue to, to get this uh, channel decode them properly. And on the data channel, the simulation show that if we use no HRQ or HRQ in Leo and Geo, we manage to to, uh, to obtain a uh, substantial uh, data rate of several uh, tens of kilobit per second, and let's say for uh, uh, an objective of 100 kilobit per second, which is, I, I think, the downlink objective of NBIoT, more or less, we can see that this is achievable using HRQ for both LEO and GEO. When it turns to uplink, this is 
some slightly different because again uplink the the the, the, um, the budget uh, the link budget on this uh, the uplink is less favorable let's say so on the control channel which is the random access meaning that the the, the ue uh, wakes up synchronize and send the packet to get connected to the network so for leo this channel is appropriately set and can be uh, decoded uh, with, no, with no issue. For GEO, because it's far away, because the, the, the also GEO uh, um, link budget is uh, not damaged, but uh, it's more difficult compared to, uh, to LEO, we need repetitions of these random access channels. And then if we provide those repetition, then we can have a, a, a pretty good detection of, of uh, this random access. When it comes to data channel, assuming a 200 milliwatt, okay, Leo, we can get a slight, uh, a, a small data rate. Geo, in comparison, this is not achievable because the, the, the SNR is too, uh, too small. When we use HRQ, okay, we, of course, the, the, the Output is, uh, is increased, and for geo we can get some bit per second uh, arising. So again, Earth is too far from geo satellite, so high up takes power is would be required. And if if we increase the transmit power, we can see that okay, for Leo of course we, we get better uh, SNR, so the, the data rate is better. And for geo, it turns out that we managed to get, namely with the jar queue. Let's say something that uh, 2.5 kilobit per second. I think the objective of uh, NBIoT for uplink is around 5 kilo. So what can be said here is that from a link level, uh, okay, geo is not quite achievable, but we are not far away, but not for, not achievable. But Leo is, I think, uh, quite suitable. Five minutes, okay. Uh, thanks. Um, so what about the capacity of the system? So here we were talking about the link. I mean, uh, one, uh, one transmitter to one receiver, and we evaluate the, the, the performance of this link. But NBIoT is a number of devices, a number of satellites, and they, all, all these devices transmit packet. And so what's the number of, the maximum number of UE that could be um, supported uh, assuming a, a given a deployment of a satellite and assuming a given um, traffic pattern. So this is what this part is about. So I will not uh, comment this graph, but this graph is a very, let's say, uh, common when it turns to uh, system level uh, a simulation. So system level simulation, we don't simulate each bit of each packet. We make an abstraction of the link and we simulate only the packet and we use, let's say, generic uh, lookup tables for, uh, for the performance. So here we implement network topology parameters. So it means devices, the, the densities, it means uh, satellites, it means number of um, spots per, uh, per antenna and, and, and so on and so forth. We implement traffic model and we implement the standardized procedure and we, we make for a number of UE, we generate all these packets. So this standardized procedure means UE synchronization, um, UE uh, random access, then the bearer establishment, including the security authentication, uh, authent um, attachment and so on, data transmission and bearer release. So all of this has been simulated uh, and just Quick comment, this has been done according to the, the discussion we had with, with the CNES for uh, a, a, a traffic pattern of 30 packets per day per UE. Okay, only uplink packets. So, what we got actually is in a nutshell. So this is the typical curve that we have, so I, I, I will not comment them. We, we, you have the packet delivery ratio here versus the number of 
do it there. And on this axis here is the latency. The dash curve is the latency, the, the, the solid curves are the, the, the packet delivery ratio. But in a sense, what we have for Leo, per spot, we can uh, connect and support the traffic of up to uh, barely 700 users, assuming 200 milliwatts. Um, if we increase the transmit power, then okay, we can have access to a higher uh, modulation rate, and then we take less time to transmit, then we, we, uh, the, the channel is less occupied, and then we can support a larger number of, of, of users, which here comes to uh, 900. But, of course, if I keep increasing the number of users, the packet delivery ratio uh, collapse, decreases, and the latency increases, of course, because there are less resources, and then it means that, okay, there is some, uh, some packet loss, uh, of course, due to that. For geo, okay, performance are uh, a little bit less, still because we are, use, we are uh, under a low signal, signal to noise ratio regime, so the, tr the, the throughput is very low, so it takes time to transmit packets. So only a few uh, user can be uh, supported per slot, per, per spot, sorry, uh, assuming a 200 milliwatt, and as we said, it's desirable to, 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 to improve, to, to increase the, the, the transmit power, and if you do that, you can see that uh, you, you can support more users. Okay, um, last slide before we conclude. This is the overall performance. This is the, the present, uh, the, the, pres the, the previous slide was one spot, per, uh, one antenna spot. Uh, one satellite has, for LEO, I think it's 58 spots, and we have 66 um, satellites to cover the, the full Earth. For GEO, we have 139 spots per antenna. Uh, so this takes all the, uh, the, the spots and it makes the, 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 the simulation over 24 hours. So what, what we see here is the number of users that could be uh, supported, assuming the same traffic pattern. But what should, what should be kept uh, in mind is that, okay, geo, the, the other problem except uh, the propagation and the, 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 uh, the link budget is the size of the, the, size of, of the cell. The higher is your, uh, your satellite, the bigger is your cell, so the higher, the higher is the number of users. So you need to uh, share your resource with more users because of this uh, cell, uh, cell size. And LEO, okay, you have better link budget, although you have uh, Doppler, but you have smaller spots, you have more satellites, so this is the reason why uh, the simulation shows that you can serve for this traffic pattern uh, a much higher number of users. Well, as a takeaway, I think this is our message that I, I, I repeated uh, several times, so I, I won't spe spend too much time on this. But the conclusion of this study, and I think this goes quite along what has been discussed by uh, uh, the, 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 the person from TAS, uh, who is uh, a uh, representative, uh, delegate, sorry, for, for TAS, uh, there are some adaptation to the standards that should be uh, considered. And as we, we, we learned this morning, some of them have been implemented. I, I didn't uh, read the, the standard yet because I, as far as I understood, it has been uh, just published uh, quite recently. So I didn't check uh, very, very well. But basically what, what needs to be accommodated in the NB-IoT standard for make it suitable for satellite is typically the timing we need to address basically the, the, the propagation delay. So it means that on the timing for the access procedure, meaning the, the, the window when you can send your, your, your random access in the, the moment that the satellite give you the, the response, this timing should be adapted to, uh, to, to the propagation delay. Also, uh, the timing advance, meaning that uh, the estimation of time when the, 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 the UE should trigger the, 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 the transmit of, uh, of the packet in order to take into account the, the, the transmission delay. 
This has been done in, in, the, uh, in the terrestrial uh, specification for uh, a cell size of, let's say, a few kilometers, uh, a few hundred of kilometers. So here, given we are talking about several thousands, so this timing advance should be, uh, should be, should be changed. Also, signaling should be accommodated uh, to, uh, for the synchronization and Doppler estimation. We also said that higher power class should be used at least for, uh, for, for geo, although uh, in IoT we don't like to, to uh, transmit too high because of the, the, um, the drain on the, the, the battery it, uh, it induces. And also the big, the big issue is the handover procedure of four Leos, because uh, you, you need to accommodate uh, uh, the, the fact that you, you need to... Okay, the satellites are moving, so you, you may want to, uh, act, to uh, get attached to another satellite. So the, the end of the procedure should be, uh, should be well uh, set uh, by 3GPP. And uh, as far as I know, this is the next uh, big uh, work uh, for release 18. Well, to, uh, to conclude, we have, th we have seen that waveform, standard waveform may fit satellite context with some adaptation, of course, but what, what we think is that specific context like satellite requires specific waveforms. So the guys from uh, Astrocast this morning or the next big step of 3GPP for, for 6G, it may induce uh, the definition of a specific waveform for satellite. So we, we, we do think that, okay, this is such a specific context that it would require a specific waveform. And uh, here in Leti, we, we like specific waveforms. And if you want to discuss that uh, about uh, high performance radio, uh, how to design them and implement them, we can meet us at our booth. What you can see uh, a demo of such uh, a system. Thank you very much. This concludes my talk. So thank you, Benoit. Uh, we can take a specific question and then, of course, the discussion will be uh, carried on during the panel session. So you initiate the panel session, <laughs> right? Yes, first question, yeah. Yes, the question is, uh, there are so many IoT systems. Uh, do you foresee specific applications that are more dedicated to connect with Geo or some others for Leo? Because Leo is a moving target, so do you need a beam former, so more complex system to, uh, to benefit from it? Yes, uh, there is a, a, an, another big um, uh, specificity is also the latency, as it has been discussed this morning. So um, Leo may accommodate, um, let's say, medium um, throughput, uh, medium latency. Uh, services. Geo, as we have seen, if we talk about IoT, uh, I think it, it would uh, accommodate very sh uh, erratic uh, transmission, uh, low data rate. But, um, well, I, I would, if I, I would try to sketch it uh, rapidly, I, I would say uh, low-end IoT, Geo, uh, high-end IoT, Leo, basically. But Leo, as you said, uh, it, it requires to address this uh, mobility issue quite well, I think. And, and uh, beamforming would be uh, a possibility to, to make, a, let's say, a, a, um, a, a, a agile enough uh, <laughs> antenna system to, uh, uh, to switch from a satellite to another one. Thank you. Thank you very much. It was very, very interesting. Uh, Michel Sartou, Kinis. Uh, my question is about uh, the downlink. Uh, your system depends a lot on the downlink. You need a, a very strong uh, downlink. So first question, uh, your study was done in L-band, I think. Absolutely. So uh, is the downlink also in L-band? Uh, have you a full duplex mode on board? And what is the constraint uh, as concerns the onboard power in order to have this uh, strong downlink? 
Um, so the, the duplex mode, as far as I know, is FDD first. Uh, so the, in, in, the, in the simulation, yes, we consider the, also the, uh, the payload side, of course. Um, I don't remember exactly the figure, but the, the, I think the um, IRP of uh, uh, the, the payload is uh, much higher than, than the, the, the UE, so, um, well, uh, I, I don't know what, what, what's, your, what's your question, uh, your question anyway. Yes, can you, can you very often, this kind of uh, IoT system is on board a small, very small satellites mm. with a low power uh, available. So my question is, uh, what is the impact of the downlink on the, on the overall uh, budget, uh, power budget, in fact? Uh, this has to be uh, uh, assessed properly. Uh, I, I can't uh, reply uh, right away, so I'm, I'm sorry about that. And my second question was, uh, is there uh, in NBIoT protocol a mode where uh, the, uh, the, the device can uh, transmit something without the downlink, in fact, a sort of backup mode uh, with no, no need to have a, a, a downlink uh, a signal, uh, uh, downlink uh, allocation, mm. uh, downlink uh, compass, uh, Doppler compensation and so on. You mean I, I wake up, I transmit, yeah. I, I go back to sleep. I, th I may speak to uh, under the supervision of uh, uh, the, 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 the person from TAS, but I think this is not the, the, uh, the philosophy of, of it. Because the philosophy is really yeah, to yeah, have yeah. both. You get uh, attached, okay. you, you synchronize, you get attached, you get connected. You open a beer. That's a, a fairly uh, direct translation of uh, cellular system. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thanks a lot, uh, Benoit, for the nice presentation. I have one quick question about uh, the first part of the study regarding the NR. Mm -hmm. Uh, you, you mentioned first that this is outdated. I don't think so because the study was uh, focused on K band. You're right. And in release 18, which is uh, which is uh, being started in uh, through GPP, uh, the focus it will be on uh, in the K band. Right. Uh, starting from uh, above 10 gigahertz. Uh, so I don't think that the study is out of date. It's it, it were to be uh, reviewed. Maybe you need to revisit the study. Uh, by considering maybe the specification of release 17, so, such as uh, time and frequency compensation. Mm -hmm. um, th then my question, you, you mentioned um, that uh, to support aircraft scenario uh, with 1,000 km per hour, uh, you need to extend some uh, the numerology. Uh, today, the max uh, numerology that for, for data is 120 kilohertz subcarry spacing numerology uh, three. Uh, uh, I would like to know what, what, what was the, 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 the numerology that you have uh, recommended? Uh, we go up to four. Uh, yes. uh, yeah, new equal four. So it means uh, if I... Uh, to, to, uh, I think to, to 40. But the, the problem yeah. is that, um, yeah, it, it were to be discussed actually. But uh, the, the main issue is that today, uh, to perform synchronization, you, you need um, the, the, the device or the user equipment is equipped by its genesis. By receiving the satellite ephemeris, it can uh, calculate by itself the uh, time in advance and uh, compensate the Doppler. And there are some requirements for the, do the, the Doppler compensation and for the time compensation. There are uh, some uh, requirements, and especially for timing synchronization, it's very challenging actually when you increase the numerology example up to 120 uh, it will um, introduce you know some uh, um, it's very challenging actually for synchronization uh, at least for the time being the max numerology that can be supported is 120 uh, but of course if um, if uh, more than 120 should be supported um, we, we need that uh, GPP to review the requirements yeah so the, the here we we use 240 new level 4 and uh, when I said we need to review uh, the, the specification, it was more related to uh, the minimum number of resources that you allocate for, uh, I think it's broadcast, broadcast channel. And this uh, 
given that the fact given the fact that we would like to address only 20 or 40 megahertz band we need to review a bit this all of them of uh, allocating you know, the resources for this this kind of thing but you're right about this uh, uh, requirement for doppler estimation but in the simulation that we have um, uh, this is this is not something that we did not have in mind yet uh, and this is not implemented yeah, th thanks. Thank you. So Rick, do you want to to come? Thank you, Benoit, again, and you can sure. stay on stage. Okay. And uh, if Antonio and Denis can join, and also uh, Laurent Le Payeur from ST Microelectronics, and I leave the floor to Eric Mercier, who is a deputy head of the Wireless Technology Department and we, we will animate uh, this uh, panel session. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, OK, thank you. OK, so thank you very much for your uh, very nice and interesting presentation. So first, I would like to introduce Laurent Le Payeur, who is a Defense and Space uh, Business Line Director at ST Microelectronic. And uh, I will give you the floor first, uh, Laurent, to introduce your uh, activity, uh, ST activity in the domain of a space component, and which kind of uh, business unit uh, does it concern at ST? Okay, so um, so I just recently joined the, the business line uh, space and defense. So before I was in charge of the CMOS program in uh, in Kroll in R and D. So I was in charge of the 28 FDSY, for instance. And uh, this is a kind of uh, closing the loop for me because uh, this is also a very good technology for, uh, for space. Uh, when we look to the space in ST, in fact, it's a long, uh, long history. Hein. The first certification from ESA for the site of uh, VREN for packaging was in 1977. So it, it was much before even uh, the creation of SGS Thompson on, uh, on ST. Then uh, when you look to the system, the basic system for communication, it's always about the same. You have a digital part, a processor or a networker. You're having converters. You're having uh, maybe uh, RF, RST, um, ESD protection and power uh, supply. And the way we manage that inside ST is basically there is a RFC communication, uh, so RF communication division, where I'm building to, which is taking over the, let's say, the RF and digital ASICs. For, uh, for different applications, but it includes uh, the space. Then there are a lot of, uh, let's say, uh, external components. And uh, these components, uh, together with an uh, with, uh, analog group in ST, we are for, uh, providing ESD, power management, uh, standalone uh, A2D converters, and uh, LVDS, or so some high speed interface. So different components that are creating a kind of a virtual platform with, uh, for space. And uh, in terms of production, so it means we are working with uh, Agrate in uh, so close to Milano, uh, Catania, Kroll for the FDSOI, for the Bicimos. And uh, in packaging, we are working with, uh, let's say, our own plants in uh, Muir, for instance. But we're having a dedicated plant in uh, Rennes that is dedicated to space and that is covering, let's say, uh, ceramic and plastic uh, packages. Okay. Thank you very much for this introduction. So, as uh, uh, as the question to to Denis, uh, after we will go back to you, Laurent. Uh, you presented the fact that there is a, a very uh, major interest in reducing the size and the weight of the component. So, do you see some other passive component that may uh, benefit from, let's say, consumer electronic uh, technologies and is there also some other uh, frequency bands uh, for which we could use uh, your uh, integration to reduce this uh, weight and, uh, and size? Um, regarding the frequency, um, what I presented today was up to 4 gigahertz, a little bit higher. Uh, Manufacturers that are involved in the mobile communication, they have only a higher frequencies uh, available. Uh, but when you go up in frequency, uh, you have a trade-off between the, the width of the band that you can do and the insertion loss. 
So the higher you go, it means the thinner your material, the thinner your material, the lower the bandwidth. So you have to compensate, for example, if you're using aluminum nitride, which is a very commonly uh, used uh, piezoelectric layer, you can dope it with a scandium, for example, to increase the uh, cooking coefficient and then the bandwidth of the filter. And uh, you can also add some passive elements around the filter to increase its bandwidth. But it's always a trade-off between uh, the width of the band that you want to achieve and the insertion loss that you can uh, withstand. But uh, yes, you can uh, you can go up to today. I would say uh, seven maximum. But uh, some universities have already made some studies up to higher frequency. But if you mean uh, being ready tomorrow with uh, this technology for expand, I would say you know uh, it will take a few years. But uh, I'm not saying that it will not go because uh, a few years ago already five or six gigahertz was. Uh, not even mentioned like 10 years ago, but today it's something that is there. So uh, space uh, components may benefit from uh, consumer electronics and uh, depending on where we want to go and uh, the, the, the target that we want to address, it's possible to consider these for uh, this specific space uh, system. Yes, but it will depend on the band you are targeting. If you're targeting K-A band, I would say uh, no, not yet. Except if you try to work with uh, higher modes in the uh, in the piezoelectric layer, but then you will have some trade-off also. But uh, no, not yet for K-A band, even K-U band, but uh, X band, it's something that is close. But higher, it's hard, to, it's hard for now. OK, thank you. And uh, so on the ST microelectronic side, uh, due to the fact that uh, we've seen that uh, Leo, uh, Leo constellations are very popular and there are more and more satellites, um, are you challenged by your customer or asked uh, to develop new solutions or, let's say, more integrated, uh, larger, and uh, probably, this is a question, uh, very cost effective uh, indeed as uh, we consider that there will be uh, thousands of satellites uh, above us yes uh, for sure in fact the cost is uh, is already a problem with uh, with geo because we are talking about payload and uh, the reason why uh, power consumption is so important in satellite is the fact that uh, you have to pay for the for sending the material in uh, in the sky and uh, even the solar panels are expensive. So in general, you have to gain on power consumption and it's good for Leo, it's good for, for Geo. Leo is a bit different animal. Uh, you need to have thousands now, uh, very low latency systems. So uh, developing so many satellites means also you have to reduce the cost of each individual satellite on the launcher. And because of that, you need to come with uh, disruptive technologies. So removing the mechanics and, uh, for instance, uh, beam former is a way also to reduce the cost on, uh, of the antenna. And uh, yes, definitely, we develop new technologies for that. Uh, what we see also, uh, as we discuss with, uh, with the filters, uh, a bit like the 5G, uh, when you go Leo, you will need also to get all the bandwidth you can grab in order to improve the, the bandwidth of uh, achievable bandwidth for customers. And it means that uh, moving from 6 giga, from t uh, you may go higher frequency. And the technology that are good for 6 are not good for 28. So you have to be uh, innovative always. But the space has always been uh, innovative somehow. OK. Uh, still discussing about cost. Uh, so Antonio, you presented uh, your solution of a transmitter array. And the scenario was uh, to be uh, on board uh, on, a, on a plane. So if we imagine that this solution uh, could be also uh, deployed for uh, households, uh, for ground to space communication, and that we imagine that there will be millions of uh, access points, uh, can you comment about the, the cost of your solution? Do you require specific uh, material that are expensive, for instance, or can it be cost effective? <laughs> <laughs> So this is a very hard question uh, to, to have an answer, uh, a fixed answer. So um, when you consider electronic scanning antenna, you have uh, several uh, devices that you need to, to 
quinta grado on the, on the, on the antenna. Uh, so uh, we presented a solution that is based on uh, pin diodes. Uh, for, for the moment, for each panel of the antenna, you need to have uh, uh, up to uh, 30,000, yeah, several thousand of, uh, of pin diodes. So the, the, we need, we need to, do, to develop some specific uh, device for me. Uh, in order to to reduce the cost, and we need to control the the production also of this uh, of this kind of device. That uh, maybe we, what we can do is to to develop some specific device that can be used for uh, dual communication, for example, for 5G for terrestrial uh, uh, networks, but also for the space. We have the opportunity for me to do this because the the frequency band that we are target for the moment in key band are very close. For example, for the 5G, you have a around 24 uh, giga, 26, and the space communication are around uh, 20 and 28 giga. So we, we, we need to, to, to join maybe the, the effort in order to, to develop some specific, specific component in order to, to reduce the cost of the production and integration also. And we can also use some common strategy to develop the antenna system. And regarding the PCB itself, uh, is it, is it a, a very common uh, PCB or do you require some specific layers uh, that, that can be uh, costly? No, no, for, for the moment we are using only uh, standard technology, standard PCB technology in order to develop this kind of uh, demonstrator. Yeah. So, but maybe for the future if we need to use uh, higher frequency bandwidth, we need to do some effort in order to develop some kind of new, uh, of new, uh, of new PCB and uh, packaging strategy. For example, uh, glass uh, or some kind of hybrid stacked uh, packaging. Yeah. Okay, thank you for the uh, this answer. Okay, so uh, now Benoit. Uh, <laughs> You mentioned that uh, there could be some interesting uh, ways uh, of uh, improvements working on the the phi, uh, the waveform uh, of this communication. Uh, I guess that you have some of them in mind. And uh, do, do, do we at Leti have some, uh, let's say, new waveform that we could propose or uh, that would uh, improve uh, performance in general? Well, uh, if, if we talk uh, about IoT, for instance, uh, where I think there is uh, room for, uh, for this improvement. What, what means IoT? IoT means actually um, extended um, link, link budget, meaning that uh, you, you, you need to, to, uh, to fight against the propagation uh, loss. So it means that uh, you have to work on, on very uh, low uh, SNR regime. And also in, uh, in IoT, what you don't like, it, it's to, uh, it, it goes uh, along the same line, to transmit too high because it, it drains too many power on your, on your battery. And on top of that, you don't want to, you, you, yeah, you don't want to, uh, to use modulation with high uh, PRPR, which would imply to take back off on your uh, uh, on your uh, power amplifier uh, uh, functioning points. So, in in other words, you you, you need to find um, a waveform which works on those lines of um, sh uh, low SNR regime and as much as you can um, constant envelope. Okay, basically that, that's that's the, the thing. So there is some, uh, let's say, uh, work in, uh, here in, in Leti about such uh, a waveform that could provide these uh, features. It has been recently uh, developed in, uh, in CA and uh, it's based on a, an FSK uh, scheme. And uh, using iterative uh, receiver, we can also try to, to to work on very low SNR. So it may be a, 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 an idea that I, I would recommend if you ask me the question. <laughs> okay. 
Yes, uh, this is a good answer. Yeah. Thank you very much. <laughs> Okay, and, and on the other end, the, the, on the, the protocol uh, end, we, we saw this morning that there, there could be a convergence uh, between uh, current uh, 5G communication and uh, uh, non-terrestrial networks. So uh, how do you see that uh, coming and w what could be the, let's say, the, the focus, the technical focus to, to be able to, to do this conversion maybe in five years or ten years? Thank you for, for, for your good question. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> That's very nice. Uh, anyway, um, so co convergence. Um, well, uh, what 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 we um, what we what we see is that if we convergence means that you can use both uh, systems at a time. And then uh, you 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 may want to make them coexist uh, in in a given uh, in a given bandwidth. And then uh, I'm not talking about talking about orchestration of a resource of uh, traffic uh, steering towards one or another one, but just on the physical layer aspect. Uh, if you have both a system working, uh, you 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 may want to uh, let's say. Uh, organize a peaceful coexistence of those systems so um, maybe solutions would be that if you if you have uh, one given uh, spectral resource allocated for those two systems then uh, what is at stake is how you can uh, make uh, um, good coexistence with while reducing the, the the guard band that you have between the two systems and then here there is maybe some room for uh, um, nice waveforms that allows this uh, a close coexistence. Um, well, and also, um, there is ongoing works about what they call uh, AAB, this uh, integrated access and back all this, let's say, uh, coverage extension, and we see uh, satellite communication as a good way to, to bring at some point, for instance, for uh, um, it, it, this corresponds to specific use cases, for instance, for post-disaster or a uh, specific event. Uh, you, you want to, to provide extra coverage and then maybe uh, using satellite and integrated access and backhaul, meaning that you have uh, on the terrestrial station one link that talks to the, to the, to the satellite and one uh, other, um, let's say, uh, front end, uh, RF front end that is able to address also the access of UEs. That could be uh, a nice feature to, uh, to work on for the, for the coming years. So, before having a, a full convergence, mm. uh, we would first work on specific scenarios that would help mm. to consider yeah. the right slicing yeah. able to, to address this. Absolutely. And, and uh, if I can drift a little a little bit more I, I would say that here in Leti, this is i think where our value lies it's on this is written on the screen but in specific context and i think there is specific answers to provide and maybe this is where we can uh, find the, uh, uh, the, the 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 real value of Leti and the, the, the situation that we just discussed about aab that would require a specific uh, antenna system, RF system, and also basement uh, system to, 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 to make this dual connectivity uh, feasible. Thank you, Benoit. Thank you. And uh, I, I would like to leave time for questions if you have some of a discussion uh, with our speakers today. Maybe a maybe, uh, last question to, to Laurent about uh, technology. Uh, uh, do uh, ST microelectronic technologies ready for uh, space application today? <laughs> That's a good one. <laughs> Long time we are. <laughs> so yeah. Yeah. So which question? I mean, with, in relation with uh, <laughs> the current uh, solution that we can see on the the consumer uh, electronic uh, market. Uh, does uh, the technology uh, able to address also the the, the space market? Do this technology able to address also the spa space market? I think about, uh, for instance, uh, FDI 20, uh, 28 and uh, 
some maybe some other commercial technologies? Yeah, definitely for the FDSO, yes. Uh, for, for me, the satellite communication is really like wh what we have seen for the mobile phone. Huh? We are starting uh, with just voice and then progressively uh, high bandwidth on a, a lot of features. And we see the same with, uh, with satellite, no, with, uh, with Leo on the need for, uh, for more performance. You need also more performance for geo in general, so it means that uh, more for money, you need to change the architecture. Uh, when you go for a better lithography, so denser uh, number, of, uh, yes, uh, smaller transistors, uh, the particle size is still the biggest one. So it's not changing, so in the end, uh, it's a problem. The analog is still needing some high voltage, and because of that, the oxide cannot shrink. So the partitioning can be different depending on the type of technology we will be using on the robustness to radiation, to particles, etc. Uh, you can play with the technology to improve it. You can play with the technology platform, means the libraries, and you can play with the system, rather than C or some others. So it means that uh, the, there are still a lot of, uh, opportunity, a lot of opportunity to innovate, to, to, to continue the, the adventure in space, yes, for sure. And uh, for your specific question about are we ready uh, for uh, space, yes, we're having the certification, we're having products in uh, QMLV, on uh, ESCC, uh, etc. So, yes, we're ready. Okay. Thank you very much. So, I think we can uh, hand one question. That's okay, you, you can ask your question. So, I think we can end this panel and maybe uh, answer some, uh, some questions from the audience, if you are ready to, to stay a little bit more. actually had a very short question because uh, so if we look to SpaceX and the dish done by Starlink uh, that is done in KU band uh, apparently the cost is about uh, $600 and uh, with the prediction of 2 million terminal on the ground so now everybody wants to go to K band everybody dreams about uh, the technology in K band uh, so is the technology ready what would be the cost that we may have? And uh, everybody's looking for a terminal that is lower than $1,000, uh, but is that realistic? When will arrive there? I will not answer specifically for a customer. What I can answer is that uh, if you think about uh, beam forming, uh, it's a matter of LNA and PA. So if you are able to have the technologies that are having better noise figure, maybe you can reduce by two the number of elements in the antenna. And this is a straightforward way to reduce the cost of the antenna. So you can play different uh, topics, and it's the same for the, for the power. But uh, so I guess that uh, going to higher frequency, you will have the, the same trend to play with different frequencies and uh, uh, playing with different technologies, I mean, in order to, uh, to benefit from it. And we continue to, uh, to develop this. For instance, we are having a very high performance uh, by CMOS technologies coming. You increase the FT, the Fmax, and this is allowing also extra uh, performance. I will not comment on that. <laughs> uh, sure that we have, uh, we can reduce the size of the antenna or, or not? Because uh, if you need to, to respect the, the radiation mask, especially in key band, you can see that uh, the beam should be very narrow. So if we reduce the, the surface of the antenna, we will have a, a, a larger beam and we will be not compatible with masks. So this is a question for also for the for the people that are talking about the, the specification. And the, so I think that at the same time, we need to, to develop the technology, but we need also to modify a little bit the standard. Uh, even if you look at the, the, the beam steering, uh, we cannot use today the mask that are calculated 20 years ago in order to reduce the interference between the satellite and the, and the terminal by considering that the antenna is a fixed beam. So we need to work about this because uh, if you would like to, to respect the specification that Mauro say, uh, in terms of cost, we need to work on several different points. Technological point of view, standardization point of view, integration point of view. Yeah. 
we need to merge the the the, 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 the different uh, action. So it was only a comment. I fully sure it has always been like this. Uh, just playing with technology to gain down cost is not uh, is not enough. Uh, yeah. On the same topic, uh, could you uh, is there, uh, in your sense uh, is there a transmitter array could compete with uh, the, the, the technology already used or, or, or used or today in uh, in Starlink systems? So uh, the Starlink system is in a Q band. Uh, I think uh, yes. So in Q band, you have uh, not the limitation of the circular polarization. So uh, we have three dB more that we can gain directly in the uh, in in our budget. So after that, we need to see uh, what is the cost of the Starlink container, what will be the cost and the power consumption of our solution. So I think that we yes, uh, we have a possibility. Now we need to, to see in, uh, we need to develop the antenna. So, but I think yes. <laughs> yeah, maybe also to, the Starlink antenna actually is true, is a phased array, but it also has a motor. And maybe something that it would be also nice to comment, what about the power consumption? Because if we look to the Starlink antenna, the dish, it gets hot. It's already a problem sometime of stopping the link because it gets over the threshold. So what is going to happen in K-band? This is a good question. <laughs> so um, we need to have the data before to... Yeah, because sometimes in uh, several phase array it's very hard to have the, the correct data because sometimes we have the peak gain, so we have the power consumption when, when the power amplifier is in saturation. So there are a, a lot of, uh, of different parameters that uh, if you change the budget of uh, 2, 3 dB in the power consumption, you will have a double uh, power consumption. So it's very hard to, to correctly do the benchmark also. So. Okay, so thank you very much for the presentation and the discussion. And of course, feel free to, to ask our speakers uh, any question you have. Thank you again. <laughs>